doesn't bother you, killing those people. Well, I wouldn't be very good at my job if it did. I don't believe you. It's a bit strange and probably ridiculous to say, but my favourite scene from my favourite Bond movie, considering all the mass of spectacle and ludicrously fun action sets and everything, is a short, quiet moment of Bond washing his face and drinking a glass of whiskey, trying to compose himself for a game of poker, having just killed a ton of people. And it's fun how it connects back to the beginning of this film also, I've always liked how Casino Royale starts in black and white, an effect that can often seem a bit of a gimmick in films, but it fits here because it evokes the feel of classic spy stories, or something film noir where Bond has the sort of suave, calming control manner we've always expected him to, a tense, considered conversation at gunpoint between two sophisticated spies. All of which is blown apart by shots spliced in of Bond's first kill. We flip between images of that and him calmly discussing it here. How did you die? Your contact? Not well. <laughs> We're given a view into Bond's mind beyond this impenetrable exterior. What he discusses so comfortably on the surface is actually shown to be traumatic. So the change from this white and black beginning to the colour that appears with blood and the classic gun barrel sequence isn't just effective because it fits into this classic gun barrel component of all the Bond films, but because it establishes very clearly what this reboot of Bond will be suave and sophisticated only on the surface, the deeper Bond we'll see here is more troubled and rugged and raw. It might look cool when Bond turns and fires the gun and we spill away into a colourful casino styled theme, but we've also seen the ugliness behind it. And I suppose that as a concept is pretty much at the heart of the main drama in this film. Bond's on the one hand having to appear this suave, calm and collected man in order to play poker, to hide his inner doubts and troubles in the face of a wonderfully formidable Lashif, while at the same time having to deal with the many traumatic and stressful situations that threaten to unmask his poker face. The classic spy Bond set against the rugged, troubled Bond, a battle to suppress his internal conflicts that we see perfectly in this short moment of him frantically ripping off his shirt and mopping up his blood. His shaky shots just a little too close up that flip angles in a disorientating way, slowly becoming a little more ordered as Bond begins to compose himself where we then get a still shot of his reflection. Then immediately cut back to the poker game and Bond making quips again. But I won't consider myself to be in trouble until I start weeping blood. Poker really is the perfect metaphor to play out that conflict. It, um, also serves to recast all of Bond's often ridiculous and sometimes quite troubling one-liners, violence, forced perfection into something more believable. And by no means is this the only film to do that, but uh, that classic broccoli and Saltzman image of Bond as this kind of perfect man that appealed as someone to aspire to, it's an outdated image that they hear rework not by changing the character's personality, but by adding a believable struggle as to why he is the way he is. He has to be, of course he does, that's his line of work, it's not glamorous under the surface, but it's an armour to protect him. Seen best actually in a touching moment between him and Vesper. She exclaims after everything they've been through, I just want you to know that if all there was left of you was your smile and your little finger, you'd still be more of a man than anyone I've ever met. Bond, of course, struggles with this sort of expression. I think the fact something like this is being said at all just goes to show how much deeper his relationship with Vesper runs than with most of the Bond girls, but his face remains the same unreadable poker face he has shown throughout this film. And when he speaks, it's not with empathy, but with a very Bond-like quip. That's because you know what I can do with my little finger. It's a great moment. I've always enjoyed all the one-liners in the old films. They're all completely ridiculous. That's why they're fun. But at the same time, it's nice to see a film take that side of the character and deliberately reveal it as something quite forced. You're not going to let me in there. Are you? You've got your armour back on. And she's right, of course, or at least partly right. He does have his armour on again, even if he then says, I have no armour left. 
You stripped it from me. He does. He's distancing himself from the emotion of what she said. His armor is there. The sheer fact, however, that he even opts to say that seriously, um, despite how vulnerable it must make him feel to be that emotionally honest. The sheer fact he struggles against that in order to tell her, Whatever is left of me. Whatever is left of me. Whatever I am. I'm yours. He doesn't say it with a great deal of emotion. No, the touch in Daniel Craig's acting to have him ever so slightly falter on the line, whatever is left of me, to then physically force himself to repeat it as though this is a sentence he's having to wrench out of his mouth. Uh, the sheer fact Bond will choose consciously to tell her this shows he will let her in. He does still have his armor on, you can't just strip it away after several days. He looks emotionally distant as he speaks, but he lets a little crack of his inner self show here, and that's incredibly powerful. I think all of us, to some extent, or at least myself, um, can probably relate to some of that struggle. Recognising the need and the feeling to say something deeply emotional to someone you care about, set against how vulnerable it makes you feel to say it, and how awkward that kind of intimacy can be experienced, but he consciously persists in saying it because it's the right thing to say and whilst we don't technically see that much screen time between him and Vesper, um, it stands to make their connection quite touching and in my opinion the best of any of the Bond films. I once had a university lecturer that said of stories that we basically like to see smart people doing smart things as protagonists, to which I think there is some truth, you know, we enjoy Tyrion outsmarting others in situations, or Andy Dufresne finding ways around the prison system, or uh, Jack Sparrow making narrow escapes from sticky situations, those three are all different types of smarts, but all satisfying to watch. On the other hand though, I can think um, sometimes when characters are too smart, it can become unsatisfying because it's hard to follow their leaps in logic, or we feel ourselves kind of getting left behind rather than uh, going along on the journey with them. Whilst I love BBC Sherlock series for example, I can fully understand why people tend to find his long deductions off-putting. So I don't necessarily think we do like to see smart people doing smart things. What I think we like to see is ingenuity born out of difficult environments, and Bond in Casino Royale is the perfect example for this. Let me take the first action sequence to explain my point. A chase scene against a free running bomb maker who leads the chase through a construction site knowing the many obstacles he can skillfully pass will slow down Bond. It's a problem he solves quickly in the moment with the ingenuity to hijack a digger and crash through the obstacles. A it shows good character, shows this more raw and brash kind of destructive bond, but B shows him thinking creatively in a split second, and that's satisfying to watch. The bomb maker climbs up a crane holding a stack of pipes, so Bond, a worse climber, detaches the pipes and reels himself to the top in order to catch up. But we can take another moment, Bond needs to check the security footage in an expensive hotel, so he parks, then stands at the front tying his shoe and waits for someone to assume he's a valet driver. Are you going to take this or make me wait? Certainly, sir. He then crashes their car into someone else's out of view of the cameras, setting off all the alarms, sending the security running so he can walk into their office unobstructed. But when he sees his target in the security footage stepping out of an Aston Martin, he goes to the reception and says, I was here for dinner last night, and I parked my car next to a very beautiful 1964 Aston Martin. And I'm ashamed to say I nicked the door, you wouldn't happen to know who. Mr. Demetrius. And when Bond presses he'd like to find Demetrius so he can apologise, the receptionist tells him where he's staying. It's... Clever. Maybe you have to suspend disbelief a little there, but this film is packed full of Bond showing simple ingenuity to work his way through situations. I think all of the action scenes, chase scenes, investigation scenes are built around moments where Bond has to show creative thinking to solve small problems. Which is why I think, as fun as all the flashy gadgets always are, they can become a bit too much, because they take away that space for ingenuity. 
If Bond already has some exploding pen or clever watch or whatever else to solve the problems for him, we don't get the satisfaction of seeing this creative thinking in action. Um, gadgets are fine, they are fun, just provided they don't stifle those opportunities for ingenuity, I think. And when I think about it, that's a big part of what makes the poker in this film so engaging. It might, um, lack action, even if there's still lots of it split up between the intervals and things, but there's mind games, there's space for that sort of ingenuity through the psychological battle of poker. The idea of a tell in poker is an interesting one to me. I don't know much about it, but for what is essentially a spy story, a signal in someone's behaviour or expressions that show when they are bluffing makes for a good motif. Um, one that comes back round when Vespa asks Bond... Does everyone have a tell? Everyone. Everyone except you. Of course, Bond can't spot hers because he's not trying to read and analyse her the way he might do opponents in poker. He um, cares too much for her to be that objective, but it does leave me to wonder if she actually has a tale hidden away in this film. I'm not sure if the actress or directors would have added that in, or if the story actually provides enough space to see it, but um, I do wonder if someone smarter or with more time on their hands than me could go back through the film watching out for it in her behaviour. I don't know, I think she holds noticeably intense eye contact in certain moments that I suppose you could argue is like her holding her breath, um, freezing into this guarded expression as though afraid she's going to get found out or something. Someone gave that to you. He's a very lucky man. I think that could be a bit of a stretch though. Um, she's a fascinating character to watch for this total conflicted guilt and fear in her feelings. Afraid for her kidnapped boyfriend, but wanting to save him means betraying her government, actively funding terrorism, and putting another man she's rapidly developing feelings for in danger. All of this hanging on the balance of who wins and loses a game of poker, and in the moment where Bond is about to lose, we see her gripping her hands tightly, fidgeting a little, um, gulping deeply in the moment where Bond goes all in, then when he does actually lose, looking around nervously as though someone's going to attack her. She's got what she wanted, but she feels guilt about it, whereas after Bond does buy back in and eventually wins, her intense stare returns. Congratulations. You know, I think the celebration's in order. This film is technically a tragedy. The tragedy that the very person who might prove able to open Bond up is the very same person put in a position where she's forced to betray him. The tragedy too, that she places herself beyond redemption. It all becomes a lesson learned from M's perspective. Don't trust anybody. In ordinary life it wouldn't be a good lesson, but in the world of a double agent, the world of a man whose only purpose outside of his work has been torn away from him, it becomes essential. James Bond is solidified, ruthless as an agent, unhealthy as a man. The name's Bond. James Bond. Casino Royale was probably my favourite film as a kid growing up, so not having watched it in years, it's nice to see it still holds up as well as I remember. It wasn't actually the release of No Time To Die that got me thinking to watch this, it was actually the Casino Royale theme song coming up on YouTube, which I think is easily the best theme song out of any of them, not just because I really like Chris Cornell. But these have been my thoughts in general, let me know what you think. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you want to help me reach the 100,000th goal. We are so close now, my god. Um, and support me on Patreon if you fancy, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. As ever, a special thank you goes to Devin, Kestrel, Arwen, Janice McMahon, Luke Hoare, Chichu Kaber, Michael Gallagher, Samara Salsi, Sharakov2814, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramwell, Incomplete Sentience, Emily Taras, and Nicholas Patrick. Thank you.